As promised, we start our number two by having a conversation with the head football coach at Missouri. He's entering his third season with the Tigers, one of two coaches in school history to lead the team to bowl games in each of their first two seasons. He led App State to a conference title and a top 20 finish back in 2019. Missouri is going to open up against Louisiana Tech on September 1st. Eli Drinkwitz is my guest. Eli, it's always good to have you on and good to have you back. How are you? Man, I'm doing better than you are. You sound like crap, but you got an opportunity to display some toughness today, Jim, and that's really what fall camp's all about, isn't it? Dude, you are the best. That is the greatest thing that a guest has said to me in a long, long, long time. You sound like crap, Rome, but you have an opportunity. That, that was a legendary response, Eli. I almost want to walk off on that because that in and of itself would already make for one of the best interviews I've ever conducted. You should be very proud of yourself. That was awesome. All right, well, I having said that, it. that was so great. And I was, I was going to say this too, Jim. I thought you were going to introduce my record. But with the latest allegations against Tennessee, let's hold up on what my record is because I expect them to vacate some wins, and that's going to help my record a little bit. Okay? Oh, man, this, so, is, this is getting be better. Easy. This is getting so much better. Can I ask you, I wasn't necessarily going to go there, but you would be the beneficiary of that. Can I, Since you brought it up, can I get your reaction to the latest allegations against Tennessee? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, me personally, i got to question my wife's commitment to winning. You know, I mean, I don't know how much she's committed if she's not engaging in some of these things. I didn't know that was fair play. So, uh, you know, we got to, you know, it was a little bit surprising to see the uh, in-depth nature of what was going on there. Uh, but I, I am sure glad that Tennessee was taking some ownership of it. And, and uh, we'll see what the results are, um, you know, but uh, it's pretty interesting for sure. My man, if I were you, I'd walk off right now, and then you can go down as the best guest ever. Eli, one more thought about that. It's one thing to say that I didn't know that my wife could get involved and help me cheat. Well, that's not what you said, but I'll say that. Even better, that she did, did she not used to have some sort of compliance responsibility where she had been previously as well? One thing to have the wife involved, but what if she was involved also in compliance and making sure that they follow the rules, allegedly? How much better is that make it i mean it's uh shoot pressure you know pressure does crazy things to people and uh you know there's a lot of pressure to win in the sec so that's i don't know that's that's crazy Eli Drinkwitz, my guest, and a great one at that. So <laughs> I was going to start you off with something else, but that that's better. I sound like crap in Tennessee cheats. Anyway, what about this? SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey yeah. declared that you are the owner of the largest Jordan shoe collection of any FBS head coach. First off, would you agree with that assessment? And then given how large it is, what are some of your favorite pairs? <laughs> First, uh, first off, uh, I definitely do not have the largest one in the uh, uh, in college football. My man Tony Elliott at Virginia is a definite sneakerhead, and he's got a ton. And and uh, my guy Lincoln Riley at, at USC, they used to be a Jordan school. They got plenty. I've got a I've got a decent collection. I, I think uh, it's been something I've kind of got interested in. And uh, you know, now that I've been able to financially have a little freedom that I can purchase you know, shoes the way I want to, you just kind of match up your shoes to your outfit and add a little swag to, to what you're trying to wear that day. That's that's kind of how I go about it. I love it. Eli Drinkwitz joining us. He's the head coach at Missouri. All right, so you're going to open up with three non-conference games when SEC play starts. Then you go to Auburn. You're at home against Georgia. Then you go to Gainesville for three straight weeks. Pretty daunting stretch, but so is living in the SEC. What are you learning or looking to learn and establish about your team before you get to the SEC opener? Well, I mean, uh, playing La Tech, a team that's going to have a brand new coaching staff, you're not quite sure what they're going to do, uh, and then you got to go play at K State is is a huge challenge in and of itself. And so, I think for us, I mean, the number one thing we have to do is improve on defense. You know, defense wins championships, and uh, we haven't even been close to a championship level defense quite yet. And so. We, we've got to improve there. Uh, I think the biggest thing for us in showing those no signs of improvement would be, you know, there were three games we lost last year. Where we had the it was either lead or tied in the fourth quarter. We got to have the ability to close out games on defense. Um, 
And, and so that's the number one thing we got to improve on in the first three games. And then I think the second thing we got to do is be more explosive offensively. We kind of got into a bunker mentality where we were trying to play not to lose and protect people. And we can't do that. We got to let our quarterbacks go out there and play the game and, and uh, live on the edge a little bit, be more explosive. Uh, and so I, I think really for me, that's, that's what fall camp is for us is push, push the envelope offensively with our quarterback play and then defensively build that toughness. Uh, and that consistency that plays at a championship level. All right, so I love that mindset. Eli Drinkwitz joining us. I love the mindset that we have to be more explosive, that playing not to lose is going to get you beat. But what about this? You're replacing your starting quarterback and a record-setting running back. So what's the mindset offensively in trying to replace key guys like that? Well, I think that's exactly it. I mean, now I'll say this about our, our running back, who is a heck of a player. The Baltimore Ravens are going to be really glad that they got him. But going into the season, nobody expected him to be who he was. He got that opportunity. He took advantage of it. And that's what's so beautiful about college football is it's players taking advantage of opportunities. Um, and and that's, a, that's the same mindset our quarterback's got to have. And, and we can't play scared at the quarterback position. And I can't call play scared at the quarterback position. I've got to be aggressive. we got to have an aggressive mindset. I think the other thing with whoever our quarterback is going to be, uh, you know, we're going to have the ability to let him create – uh, you know, it's the old Bill Parcells quote, man, we're, we're going to give him the ingredients. He gets to cook the meal, you know, and so we're going to let him play to his strengths, have the framework for what we want him to do, but him go out there and create. We are talking Missouri football. We're talking mindset, too. Something else about mindset. You made the point. I think this is really interesting. Quote, the discipline, discipline to compete precedes the discipline to win. Can you break that down for me? What does the discipline to compete look like? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes like this. Everybody wants to win, right? You want to go out there and win, but it's a discipline that every single play you're going to compete to be your very best. And if you can think about that, like I go out to a a practice, I go out to lift weights, like, yeah, we want to win on Saturdays, but if you don't go out there and compete every single rep today in practice, you're not going to win on Saturday. And there has to be a discipline to that. Uh, Coach Saban, I would say, calls that the process for us, it's just that discipline to compete where every single day it all matters and adds up to winning. You know, on top of that, and I do love that, you need to compete at everything all day, every day, all week in order to have Saturday go the way you want Saturday to go. But then you're looking for a certain type of player, right? You told the Athletic this generation is one that wants to leave its mark on a place. They're trailblazers. They want to go build colonies on Mars, stuff like that. So it's kind of the same thing for me in college football. This is one of those untapped frontiers. End of quote. Again, another great quote. How do you go about connecting or finding even this generation of trailblazers, how do you make the case also that Missouri is the place where they can trailblaze? Well, I think, you know, this is a place that hasn't won a national championship. Every major major sport, uh, professional sport in the state of Missouri has won a championship, whether you're talking about Sporting KC, the Cardinals, the the Blues, the Chiefs, the Royals, they've all been at the highest level, but the state of Missouri has not won a national championship in any collegiate activity that I'm, I'm aware of. And so for me, that's, that in and of itself gives you an opportunity to blaze your own trail. Um, it's been since 2007 since we won a BCS uh, uh, or New Year's Six bowl game. All right. So, again, the opportunity is there to accomplish something that hasn't been done before. And for me, that's kind of what drives me, e- even in the generation that I'm of. Like when, I went, when we were at Appalachian State, you know, we knew that as a Power Five pro, or as a Group of Five program, we had not beaten a Power Five school. We went into North Carolina, went into South Carolina, and did that. We knew that you, we, they hadn't been ranked longer than one week in their history. We went six straight weeks being ranked and then finished the season ranked. And so, those are things that we've identified. It's the same way here. I think you have to figure out what is that thing that hasn't been done before, and clearly lay it out to the team and say, hey, this is something we can accomplish. Do you all want to buy into doing this together? Eli, one thing you mentioned, generation, I'm glad you did. When you talk about generation, I mean, you're from a different generation. I'm from a different generation. You're dealing with young people, and I would say that people, not only just coaches, but really in any walks of life in terms of leadership, lots of people are quick to say that young people today are selfish or they're self-centered or they don't get it or they don't want to put the time in. What would you say generally about the young people that you are talking to, getting to know, and recruiting 
recruiting, what's the vibe like? Are they so different now than they used to be back in the day, back from the ones you coached at Springdale High School back in the day? How would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're different, but I think that's from us, that's projecting. We're the one that raised them, so we just raised them uh, in a way that was different than the way we were raised. That goes into a whole different psychology of, of, of why it's that way. Yeah, they're absolutely different, um, but it does, different doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's different, so you have to embrace the, the differences, embrace the changes. We're all human. Um, we all want to win at something. We just got to find what makes people tick, and, you know, I think for us – uh, what we've kind of figured out is we got to make sure that they understand winning has its rewards. You know, um, in college football, you know, different than when maybe they were raised where everybody got a trophy. Man, in college football, winning has its rewards. Mediocre does not. And so we got to make sure we emphasize winning and make sure that they're rewarded when they do that. Eli, let me ask you this. My guy Ed Milet has got a great saying. Ed says that winning is more fun than fun is fun. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean the fun is in the winning. I know that, and uh, and that's that's the reason why you do it. I think there's something special about a collective group of people coming together for a common goal and then achieving that. That's a different feeling than, than you have anywhere else. And um, I, I do think too that the the fun that you have in winning is is proportional to the struggle that you have to get there. So like the bigger the struggle the bigger the fun is when you get it, when you get the reward of winning. You know, when you beat up a team that you're supposed to beat and the struggle's not all that big of a deal, the fun is it's more like a relief. But, man, when you see that team, uh, you know, in 2020, uh, you just play the defending national champions and they get four, four cracks of it on the one-yard line and you beat them at the end, Man, there ain't nothing like that feeling because Eli, that struggle was real. You know it. The struggle is real. The struggle is always real. He's the head football coach of Missouri entering his third year. They open up against Louisiana Tech on September 1st. Expectations high once again. Eli, I really appreciate you. That was an awesome conversation. Most of all, I appreciate you telling me I sound like crap. However, it's an opportunity to show grit, toughness, and an ability to persevere. So thank you very much for reminding me of that fact. And it's always good to have you on. All right, buddy. You have a good one. Thanks for inviting me on today. I loved it. Eli, I always do. You're awesome. Him starting the interview off by agreeing with me that I sound like crap and then volunteering his take on Tennessee was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Like, we could have walked off on those two things, and it would have been one of the best interviews I've ever conducted.